Greg Torres, and I've been trying to think about how to make a video on this tree. This is the slash pine. The scientific name is Pinus eliati. There's two variants, and I'm not a geneticist or a taxonomist, and they still need to figure out whether they're two species or just variants. It's Pinus eliati, variation eliati, and then there's Pinus eliati, variation densa. We're not gonna get into the differences. That's for other people to figure out. But I really did wanna highlight this tree because it's so important to the Southern ecosystems, Southeast ecosystems of the United States, especially down here in South Florida. So let's talk about it. And forgive me if I forget some details. There's a lot to consider with this plant. It's a really important plant down here and I'll do my best to explain it the best that I can. So here it is. This is the slash pine. I've heard it called slash pine for two different reasons. One, that they live in slashes, which I don't really know what that's supposed to mean. Um, sometimes they throw out these names of things and it's not a common term that everybody uses. I remember slash pine for one, I think, better reason, is in the times past, people would slash the bark in a certain manner uh, a slash marks that kind of look like a cat's face and then they would put a little tin here that would catch the oozing sap so they would slash it and that's why i remember this is the slash pine the sap that they would catch would later be turned into turpentine or a uh, pine tar which could then be used as pitch pitch was very important especially early on um, in early colonization of the United States because they would use that pitch for waterproofing, especially for shipping. Now you can see this is quite a tall, straight tree. And strangely, for a softwood, like other pines or conifers, this one has a very strong lumber quality and strength to the wood. I've even heard that its crush strength is harder than ash trees, or more, more substantial than ash which for again for a softwood being better than a hardwood for lumber is kind of impressive now you can see this plant at about my height it's only like five and a half feet a little more than that um you can see the blur burn marks on this and as you go down you see it's been burned quite quite badly here Talking about the fire ecosystem here is a whole other topic that probably another video should be made at some point. However, this plant here is highly adapted for a fire ecosystem. There's a number of reasons for this. One, if you take a look at the bark here, it comes in these flaky layers, these thin flaky layers. And even where it's been burned quite badly, if you pull it back, after a few layers deep, you see that the bark looks fairly unscathed. The reason for this is like, if anybody's ever tried to burn a book, you'll note that the outside of the pages might burn, but the interior of the book is basically intact. And it's very difficult to burn a book. So you can see that this tree has plates of this flaky bark so consequently the outside edges might be singed or even burned but it rarely actually does so much damage burn damage to the actual trunk to affect this tree look at the branching structure of this tree all the branches are way up high now I've heard this tree is being described as self-pruning. And you can even see on this one, the lower down branches are already dead. And a substantial part of those lower down branches has already fallen off. This is to prevent fire from being able to run up the branching of the tree and up into the crown to burn it. So they drop their branches and keep the ones up top so that fire can't jump all the way from the ground up the tree through the dead branches if there were some and into the crown to burn it. 
And this plant is interesting also. I think it's really kind of strange. I'm not really sure if the fire is encouraged by the plant. In a lot of ways it seems to be. Pine needles, as anybody who's burned a Christmas tree knows, they go up pretty quick. A lot of pines have chemicals called terpenes in them that are highly flammable. This pine though in particular, it drops a lot of pine needles all over. But in addition to that, it drops, literally drips of pine sap off of the branches, off of the pine cones. And if you've ever parked beneath one of these slash pine trees, you'll know the sap that drips out because it'll stick to your car and kind of mess up your vehicle in that way. But those terpenes are very flammable and they, they litter the area around the plant. And it just is strange to me that a plant would almost encourage fire mixing the terpenes from the sap with the pine needles highly flammable in the springtime florida gets a lot of lightning strikes and so the lightning oftentimes in these forests will hit this flammable tinder on the ground and just set things ablaze a healthy forest like this should be burned between two and five years so it's pretty frequent but if you think about it not that much vegetation can build up in just two to five years. And consequently, the fires tend to be, if it's in a healthy fire ecosystem, they tend to be low to the ground and not very high up. The flames won't shoot up very high and actually kill the trees. So as long as you have a pretty frequent fire regimen coming through here, you'll see burn marks like this, maybe five feet tall, but it doesn't go so high as to burn up the whole tree. Again, it seems that these plants almost encourage the fire. I know some pines, I think it's the sand pine, they have something called serotonous cones that will only open up after they've been singed by fire. And even there's some grasses in here like Spartina grass. It blooms more readily after it's been burned. So this ecosystem is highly adapted to fire and this plant in particular, like I said, is not only highly adapted for it, but almost seems to encourage it. Woodpeckers like this plant because they can flick off flakes of this bark like this and there's all kinds of insects, spiders, you can see the holes of uh, different bark beetles that live in here. I've seen pseudoscorpions, actually this is the primary place whenever I want to show off a pseudoscorpion uh, to look underneath these plates for them. They really like to hang out underneath here. Now this plant, I guess one way to ID conifers pretty frequently is to look at the bundles of needles that come off. This one usually has between three to two needles per bundle. There's two, most often three. There's another two. Again, this is the slash pine. You can find this in Georgia. You can find this definitely down here in South Florida. It thrives particularly in drier forests or mesic forests, like medium wet forests. Often in association with the salt palmetto, which you can see down here. near its base. Sometimes it's complete stands of saw palmetto with the pine coming up. Another adaptation that these pine forests, these slash pine in particular have, is that their seedlings grow quite rapidly. Within the first two or three years, they've shot up almost as tall as I have. And again, that's to try to escape as quickly as possible a, a pending fire that might be coming within five years. They jump up really quite high um, and try to get their crown established above everything else before a fire might come through and have the potential to kill it. Again, Pinus eliati, variation eliati, the Florida slash pine. This is the cone 
to the slash pine. It's got a nice reddish color, reddish brown. The most conspicuous aspect of it is that on each one of the little pieces here, there's a spike on the end. So it's kind of prickly to hold in your hand. Um, but it's kind of unique to this plant's cones that I've seen. The seeds are small and like a lot of uh, pine, they've got a little wing. They almost act like Samaras when they come out, uh, like helicopters. They've come out, they've got a wing with a seed similar to maple and they kind of flutter about. Birds will eat those and squirrels also. I've tried them. There's not much meat to the seed, but it definitely gives you the same taste as like pine nuts. So they're kind of good, but it's almost more work than it's worth to try to get a even a handful is a lot of a lot of effort. Now one of the aspects that I find remarkable about slash pine is that it's one of the pines in the world that you can derive a type of wood called fat lightered wood or fat wood. Now traditionally this has been made from longleaf pine in the southeast United States. But what it is really is just when you find a pine stump like this the resin from the tree has run into the stump and really gathered up here and created a really kind of yellowish resinous wood and the resin builds up in this and it, the resin is full of terpenes which are, it's a volatile chemical it's very flammable and the first time I discovered this was just camping in the woods and getting a log from a pine tree like this uh, at the base and putting it on the fire and just noticing how long and consistently it burned and the thick black smoke that came out of it. So later I learned that if you gather up little slivers of this wood, kind of like here, you can use this as a great kindling. So all you need is to take a, a little piece of wood like this, maybe split it into smaller pieces. Okay. Use the bigger one. Put a light to it and it immediately burns and stays lit. And the resin in here kind of acts like a candle wax in that it wicks in and continues this wood to burn for a long time. You can see there's a thick black smoke that comes out of it. So if you're ever at camping or hiking in the woods, it's kind of useful to have the, a few slivers of this fat wood, this fat lightered wood on you, just to make building campfires a lot easier. You can see even in the wind, it's staying lit. Sometimes even when it's wet, it'll stay lit. Now these terpenes in this, called terpenes because uh, we, we get the word turpentine from it. Again, it's a volatile chemical, and the resin in the past has been used. They boil it down, and you can get two products from it. You get pine tar, which can be made into pitch, and then also turpentine, which is the fumes that come off of that process. So again, fat lightered wood, excellent for kindling. Sets fire pretty quickly and easily and burns for a very long time. I just noticed this, it's kind of funny. I'm not, not even sure what the deal is, but there's a little bone stuck in the flakes of this uh, slash pine bark. It's kind of weird. I wonder what happened here. Hmm. Something this white kind of just sticks out, especially against uh, the bark of that tree.
pines are just gorgeous. They're so vertical and so straight. Oftentimes you'll even see the sap kind of oozing out the side of wounds like this. You can see it here. It's very aromatic. If you smell it, it's got a really piney, strange kind of smell. It's sweet in a sense, but it also is like cloying. It almost, the more you smell it, the more your kind of stomach turns. And you see some kind of like beads of it beading up down here. Sometimes it's crystalline, if you hold it up to the light. Sometimes it's quite beautiful. Almost looks like a bead you could make out of it. Ooh, that smell. I like it at first and then I don't. aspect about this land here if you don't have a fire go through this pretty frequently it'll the plant community will change and sometimes those changes will actually exclude the pine trees perhaps some hardwoods might get into this space and start to shade out the pines as they try to grow so having a regular fire come through here does a number of things. It burns down the vegetation. In some cases it can really kill off some of the invasive species problems. It provides like an immediate surge of nutrition in the form of ash to the soil around here. But it also clears out the area and allows certain species to persist and others to go away or not be established. And again, it kind of makes me wonder, like, are these pine forests, are they intentionally trying to encourage fire? Because it, by encouraging fire, it encourages their own success. Who knows what they think, if they think, or if it's all just Millions of years of development. Either way, it's fascinating how everything works like that, just in its right way. <laughs> 